Uh, my name is Simon Goldhill. I'm the director of CRASH. And as most people know, CRASH is the Centre for Research in Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities. And we're dedicated to interdisciplinary research. And I'm often asked, what is interdisciplinary research? Well, it's sort of something like this. Okay, it's rather one area of what we do. It's fantastic to be able to put together writers, historians, historians, writers, you can define them as you wish, but exploring a space of how we talk about the past. And for me, that's a wonderful opportunity. And we couldn't have get two more distinguished and more wonderful speakers for this occasion. Delighted to welcome you here. Uh, the session today is going to be chaired by Jean-Paul Gabriel, who I will turn over to now. And thank you all for coming. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I should begin by saying that this event was originally planned as a, as a conversation, and in spite of this very large room, uh, I think we will try to stick tonight to that informal spirit uh, of exchange and dialogue. With that, I should also thank uh, the history faculty, the Trevelyan Fund, um, acting master Alison Finch of Churchill College, and, and Simon here at CRASH for the generous funding that made it possible for, for us all to come here together. It is also, as Simon's just said, a great pleasure to see such a wide cross-section of both the history faculty, but also other faculties, uh, English, art history, anthropology, Latin American studies. I've seen a few scientists on the list as well. Um, and the wider communi community here. And I think this is a testament, if anything, uh, to the power of our speakers to captivate the imagination of their, to capture the imagination of their readers, um, such a wide circle of readers. Now, before I introduce them, let me just say a few words about the big picture here. From the universal history of Herodotus, to BBC's recent history of the world in 100 objects, writers have been experimenting for centuries with ways of mapping out the connections that linked the world. Inspired perhaps by the globalized world in which they write, scholars today are increasingly looking beyond national borders, and with them we've witnessed a proliferation of buzzwords, things that you might be seeing in titles of books lately, things like networks, motion, connectedness. Now what do these words actually mean? What are the frameworks that they bring to understanding the past? In searching for such answers, historians have also brought with them a range of powerful tools, these weapons that they wield, grand meta-narratives, local micro-histories, study of objects, biography. Uh, within this mania for going global, I think there are still important questions that remain. For example, can the history of the world really be captured in the life of a single person? Questions about typicality, exceptionality. How might grand narratives capture processes that in the end were local processes? Uh, masterful storytellers in their own right, both Natalie Zeman Davis and Amitav Ghosh, have been writing and experimenting in novel, poignant, and bold ways with several of these issues. And in doing so, they've also embraced the productive tension at the boundaries of history and fiction, sometimes, I should say, with a bit of controversy. And so the event tonight is really also meant, uh, apart from global history, to think about wider issues of narrative, plausibility, authenticity, and historical writing. In doing so, we wonder, what can historians get away with? What can novelists get away with? Perhaps what can Amitav get away with that Natalie can't in his writing about the past? <laughs> Neither of our speakers really need an introduction, so let me just say a few words about each. Um, Natalie Zeman Davis has written across a vast set of themes, periods, from the Protestant print workers of Lyon to the lives of women on the margins in the 17th century, and most recently to exchanges between Europe and Islam as captured in the life of Leo the African, El Hassan El Wazan. But when surveying this rich and diverse body of work, I thought really to do it justice in the short amount of time, you really need to do quantitative history. And so I thought I'd bring a sort of analysis inspired approach uh, to this diverse body of work. So I started counting. Let me just give you a few figures here. She has taught at three great universities, Toronto, Berkeley, and Princeton. Countless honors and prizes. I'll mention 1998, she was awarded an honorary doctorate here at the University of Cambridge, but she has also received, in total, 41 honorary degrees. <laughs> so I don't, don't mean to embarrass you. And during this time, Natalie has written over 160 articles and 11 books. Um, to take one, The Return of Martin Gare, which some of you may know in film and in writing. The Return of Martin Gare was translated into 27 languages. And I don't want to ask how many archives Natalie's visited, but as she told a group of graduate students the other day, she has a few more slated for this trip. She is truly a global historian, and as much as her work has captivated readers around the world. And the same can be said for the rich body of work given to us by Amitav Ghosh. 
Now, what some of you might not know is that Amitav uh, started life as a graduate student as well in anthropology, taking his DPhil from Oxford. Um, this explains perhaps the perceptive and powerful insights into human relations that come through in all of his novels. Now, many of you will know In an Antique Land, a mesmerizing account of medieval and modern Egypt, but there are others too, circulating now in over 20 languages, and both of our speakers, it's nice to think that someone in Turkey and someone in Finland might both talk about the stories of both of our speakers. Books like The Circle of Reason, The Shadow Lines, Dancing in Cambodia, The Calcutta Chromosome, The Glass Palace, the Hungry Tide, Sea of Poppies, shortlisted for the Man Booker, and most recently, River of Smoke. Now those of you familiar with the periods that Amitav writes about will know that it is sometimes like reading primary sources when you read his book. So thick did the details ooze off the page. And most importantly, he writes beautiful and powerful stories. So it is a great pleasure to have you both with us here today at Cambridge. Um, the format is that each of you will speak, as, as you know already, the format is that they, both of our speakers will speak um, with some opening remarks. And afterwards, uh, there will be time for exchange and dialogue and, of course, questions from all of you. So with that, let me welcome Natalie Zeman Davis. It's wonderful to be back at Cambridge. This is a, a place I have felt as home a few times, and to see uh, new faces and the faces of old friends. <clears throat> Thank you so much, John, Paul, for your introduction and for setting this conversation up. Uh, I uh, am rem reminiscing about my first connection uh, with Amitav. He actually has told me, this is gonna spoil my, my remarks, he told me that in fact we met but before you had published the, uh, the, uh, the, the, your, your great book, The Antique Land, that we actually met and shook hands when he was much younger. But I remember our connection after I had finished reading The Hungry Tide. I had read almost all of his novels, and certainly the, uh, In an Antique Land. And I, the minute I finished it, I emailed a friend saying, you will love this book. This is absolutely marvelous. A minute later, I get an email back from the friend saying, well, I'm talking to Amitav Ghosh in Harvard Square. And he laughed and said, I like Natalie's fiction of the archive as well. <laughs> so so uh, we, we uh, have shared this electronic communication and my enormous uh, admiration for his many books that I've, I've, I've read. And, and indeed, as you'll perhaps learn this afternoon, we have overlapping enterprises right now. Uh, he is. Uh, writing, I hope, the third volume of his Ibis trilogy. I have narrative de deprivation. I can't wait to find out what happens. And I'm in the middle of writing uh, a, a book about uh, a, four generations of a slave family in Suriname. So like him, I'm working, working over time uh, and uh, uh, not totally sure where this is going to end up either. The, uh, I thought I would make a few remarks about our two themes, just to lay a few things on the table. Storytelling and some thoughts about uh, historians and ways of looking at the global, at global history, the global past. Some of us, uh, wh why do some of us uh, want to tell stories, by which I mean, since all history has some kind of narrative, focused stories, uh, what some call micro-history, what I've sometimes preferred to call a close ethnographic approach, a, a focus on a singular and rich uh, exemplary case. It can be a family, it can be a cluster, it can be a boat <laughs> in which you follow the persons through uh, a family over time. In my own experience, I've actually worked in, the, we, you mentioned Martin Gare, and, and I was on Trickster Travels, I've actually worked in both modes. Uh, when I did my book on the gift, for instance, I had hundreds and hundreds of cases of gifts, of many different kinds of gifts. Or, or in working on pardon tales, I had many, many examples of, of, uh, uh, of people asking for pardon. Or in a recent piece uh, on criminal justice experienced by slaves in Suriname, I had many cases of, of punishments on plantations. So I've I'm, I worked on that, on that mode uh, as well, but I, even then, I find that to make it finally, if not come alive, I would say, to show the complexity of the argument that I'm making, even though I, I'll usually want to take a single case and tease it out, work it out, so that the general processes that I've been speculating on or describing 
uh, can be shown in, in a concrete way and sometimes in a way that turns the argument in surprising uh, directions. Uh, so, uh, the, so here with the, with the Suriname story, I am choosing, instead of doing a general study of slavery, to take a single family uh, through four generations, beginning with Africa, through the entire 18th century, ending up with some of them free and some of them still enslaved. Now, I wouldn't do this, and I think this is an important background to our making the choice to do a focused uh, stor story. Uh, I, I wouldn't, myself, choose to do that if the, if the slave plantation, its demography and economics and, and uh, some of its law hadn't already been, especially though the economic and demographic part, had not already been written about by some splendid Dutch scholars. Uh, much of it is still in Dutch, although they're beginning to publish it in English. Uh, that, but that's, that's been done, and I think that that's a necessary background. I, I wouldn't choose to do the things that I think are distinctive in being able to follow a single family through. Uh, looking at both the plantation managers and owners, the white lovers that show up along the way, the mother-daughter relationships, the father, the, the, the African grandfather. I wouldn't choose to do that if in some sense the, the broader picture weren't established, uh, and I am free then to explore new avenues within, within that frame. And indeed, uh, when I did, going back to Martin Gare, which is... Uh, has the advantage of being a, just a marvelous story to tell many, to explore many things about social relations, village relations. Here again, the basic picture of, of economic life in the long dock had been set up, and I could move into deep new areas through this, in this individual case. Now, uh, as my English reviewers have often been eager to point out, there are many challenges uh, in doing this kind of history, especially if you stubbornly decide to take people like slaves who have left very little in the way of, of voices of their own, unless you are lucky enough to get a court case or something. Most of them are illiterate, similarly with many peasants. If you decide to take a case of this kind, you may leave yourself open to many scholarly, exciting but many scholarly uh, challenges. The challenges of, of silences and gaps are not really particular only to those of us, however, who decide to take uh, a, a, a particularly challenging case. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of Stephen Nadler's very, very interesting biography of Spinoza, uh, you know, a major figure in the European landscape, if not quite as maybe major as uh, Jonathan Israel claims, but extremely important figure. And, <laughs> and at, at the critical moment uh, in which Stephen Nadler is trying to explain what we all want to know. How did this Jewish boy from this family become one of, uh, who was mostly just going to Hebrew school and the, 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 the studying the Torah, how did he become, in those few years, such a great philosopher? And Stephen Nadler does what we do, what I have done and others of us do in the same situation. He looks at context, the connections and networks in which Spinoza was involved, uh, and then uh, tries to tease out of that the possible conversations, the possible influences that Spinoza could have put to work. And similarly, um, that's the kind of thing that we do and that, that uh, I tried to do with al Wazan when I were here, here again, I had a richness of manuscripts, new manuscripts that I found. I had interesting archival material, but at certain moments there were important gaps. And there were gaps that, given the kind of historian I am, I didn't want to leave, I didn't want to be inattentive to them. Uh, I, I wanted to be able to think about this man in a whole range of situations. So I did the same kind of thing that many of you perhaps will think of in your own work. I looked at very carefully all, not only all the things that he read, but all the networks he was in, and when I didn't have specific evidence about them, I tried to put together his writing with their writings and speculate on what kind of exchange, what kind of influence, what could have been going on when he talked to this Maronite Christian or that particular Catholic or this uh, learned Jew. Or I did uh, something that is different from the Nadler, the Nadler project with Spinoza uh, when I was looking at social issues such as was, it, was, he, was he married or not, 
I, as an historian of the family and woman, was certainly not going to write a book in which I didn't ask that question. There's no way I would have done that. I simply looked at very deeply at the context and the context in the town that he lived at and the age category that he was in and looked at practices, the religious practices and the marriage practices uh, in, the, uh, in the Muslim world of, of uh, Fez in the late 15th and early years of the 16th century and speculated, and here the, uh, the scholars very close to the field would be very much in accord, that when he talked about marriage, dowry, uh, uh, the way the conduct of women that he was not only talking about a general situation in Fez, but was talking about him himself. Um, another thing that one can, uh, can do, and we talked about this this morning with some of, I talked with some of the graduate students here who were working on self-narratives, uh, is to make the silences work. That is, when you have uh, a gap, uh, and it is not just because there's been a fire in the archives, but, but uh, well, although that's interesting too, but when there's a gap um, and, and you make it, uh, or, or a silence, you think, well, why is there? Why, why in a place where you would expect someone to be talked about, for instance, or why when you would, would expect in the genre in which he's writing, uh, he doesn't say anything about, say, uh, marriage or about his conversion? Why is that? And then work with that make that, that an interesting creative problem which you try to tease out. Uh, I'll, I won't elaborate any, any, uh, any for, further on that. The, of course, the thing that we historians always do and that you don't have to do, <laughs> I don't think, is we always need to say, perhaps, maybe, we may think that, or one of my favorites is, surely. <laughs> 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 are also undoubtedly, <laughs> but that's the marker. And I'm very, very, or, or we use the conditional. And I'm very, very committed to that. Sometimes my translators in different languages get extremely exasperated, but it really, really must be there. I think the advantage of doing this isn't just that you can tell a better story or a richer story and, and make it, you know, have it more literary. I think the other advantage is, is that I see is that it allows you to collect around your character very rich and interesting information, which you are not saying definitely did happen, but it's a way to bring in a great deal around a life, and not just as, as general social description, which is fine too in another kind of book, but here as it might be lived by an individual figure. You can sort of imagine it in action. Sometimes I think of it as a thought experiment, uh, which, uh, uh, which shows you which allows you to think for a moment in, in what you're writing about a range in possibilities uh, uh, that you spell right out for your reader to think about and disagree with or to, to use in his or her own work, uh, whatever. But rather than telling it as a single trajectory, it, it allows you to open up uh, choices along the way. Well, just a word also about um, some ways to talk about the global past, the other part. Uh, not all of us want to do global history. You know, we do not all want to write world history or teach it. We just, uh, and I think that we make our own choices about what we, what we want to do. The, uh, uh, in places where they have, history has not been written at all, people, let's, let's do our own history, let's get started on our own history before we go global. What I do feel very strongly about, however, is that we should have, that we should write even when we're doing our local work with a global consciousness. And here I'm taking a leaf from the book of Deepesh Chakra Party, which I'm sure you, you've all read, the, the, uh, the, the phrase provincializing Europe, that Europe becomes uh, a case, a very important case, but a case. And uh, indeed, what, what, that what everyone looks at, including one's own local, becomes a case uh, and in which you try to bring to bear upon it uh, a sense of a wide range of possibilities, say, about how family structure could be uh, organized, about how, we, whatever, how change can occur, but that, that you don't, I mean, Deepesh Chakra Party, of course, was concerned, and this is with good reason, about the, the really overwhelming power of the European model being the one which was being, uh, through which 
the a grid, creating a grid through which the history of many other places was being uh, applied, was being passed through. Uh, and so it's this, not that we all have time to read everything, I mean, there's a limit to how much, but that we, that we try to bring to bear, even when we're doing something, say, in Europe, <laughs> the possibility of, of looking at, uh, let's say again, that's just because I use the word family structure, family structure, marriage relationships, relations across the generations, uh, not only are these seen in different cities or different rural urban, uh, different time periods in Europe, but that we bring to bear really quite different models just to ask the question about it as a, as, as a way of looking at it. And it, one might get really quite, quite uh, fresh, fresh new ideas. I had the experience on the other side. I was just trying to think, am I only saying this to European historians? Not a, uh, I had an experience recently talking to two uh, graduate students uh, doing their doctorate in Senegal uh, on issues uh, of um, marriage preference and memory in families where their slavery was part of, African slavery was part of the background. We had a most interesting discussion and it was helpful for them to hear about similar issues and control of marriage for early modern France. It doesn't mean that they, that they were going to find that, but that in this case, the African, the, uh, the French model, uh, the early modern model, was quite helpful in thinking about asking new questions about, so, it, so that's what I mean by global consciousness, that, that, uh, that we, 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 in terms of facilitating uh, comparisons, uh, comparisons that go beyond our usual boundaries that, uh, that we make in our work. Two other final things um, of a different character. Uh, one is, and this is what I'm describing here as being done by people in this room, is being, uh, in terms of the global issue, being conscious beyond what one might have initially thought of the, co of the possibilities of connections. Here I'm not thinking about comparisons, but actual connections. Uh, trade, <laughs> I'm thinking here of the work of that you're doing, Maxine Berg, it's on internet, on global Afro, you're finding new things in Euro-Asian trade, but the, the work, and again, many people in this room know this better than I, the work of, on trade, ex the archeological work that shows extensive trade patterns in prehistory across the Americas, in, in, uh, in areas way beyond Greece, in prehistoric Greece, just things that I've heard about, really is quite Im impressive, and it shows a long, a very long view, uh, to be conscious of, uh, in a way, to be, push our consciousness of the mixture of populations, even in, in a local village that we might be working in, the possibility of mixture of languages. I was interested to hear yesterday about a dissertation underway here on the multiplicity of languages spoken certain, in, your, in certain 18th, 17th, 18th century cities. Uh, to, just to be, uh, the aware of the, the possibility of much wider influences on something that we've been looking at in a much more limited uh, way. This, in my own work, uh, I was trying to press this, I'll just give you one example, to press this kind of thing uh, on the historians in the Netherlands who have done splendid social history of crime, I mean, really very good work uh, in 17th and 18th century Netherlands but it's always stayed right within the bounds of the Netherlands, uh, including in issues of penal reform and, uh, and the, the wider world in which the Dutch themselves were involved, both in regard to these practices uh, in their, uh, their uh, castles, as they call them, their forters, factor, fortresses on the African coast, or in places like Suriname, uh, are just not part of have not been part of their historical picture, even though, in fact, you can document uh, back and forth between persons uh, involved in these practices from Suriname to the Netherlands in both directions. So just opening this, this being aware beyond one's usual consciousness of very wide connections. Uh, and then finally, there, and this is where I'll, I circle around to the two of us, my final point is, of course, the choice uh, for those of us who are not writing global history textbooks or, 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 or writing, for those of us who don't have the, haven't done the marvelous book of, of David Abulafia on the Mediterranean, I mean, there is a book that really does 
the global on a wide scale and brings in, uh, I mean, it's the Mediterranean, by the way, a huge outreach. But for those of us who want to have that kind of outreach but take a local case, there is the solution of taking, uh, for one's story, uh, <coughs> figures that move very widely, families that move very widely, a boat that travels very widely that has people from many different backgrounds in it. Uh, I mean, many of you here are probably migration studies, diaspora studies, captives uh, who uh, move through the Mediterranean and stay, stay in one place for a time in, in the world of Islam and move back to Africa, into Europe and vice versa. Uh, and uh, in, in the case that I'm trying to do this, these, uh, four, these four generations with the African, uh, the, the Suriname, and then the last generation actually ending up in uh, Tiverton, Devonshire, which is where I'm going to go from here to look in the archives to see this Surinamese son of a, of a slave woman going to school in, in uh, the 18th century in Tiverton. But I think now you've heard enough about uh, uh, slavery, and I think we should now move to the boat and hear about uh, the, um, from my colleague Amitav and the, uh, the Ibis. <laughs> that was wonderful. Really wonderful. Um, well, it's wonderful to be here today. Uh, with Natalie, whose work I've so much admired for so many years and which has inspired so many people I, I know. Uh, for example, my, uh, my friend uh, Partho Chatterjee, who wrote a wonderful book also about the returned identity. And uh, it's also wonderful to be here because right across is the, uh, is the university library where I did uh, all the, well, most of the work for in an antique land, translating Geniza documents, one of the happiest periods of my life. So, and uh, thank you, John Paul, for, uh, for for setting this up and for inviting me here. Uh, I, you know, when John Paul said that this was to be a conversation, uh, you know, I felt very happy with that because I hate writing things and I hate having to <laughs> think about things. <laughs> And it's always very hard work for me. But then uh, John Paul sent us these uh, sent us these questions, and the, uh, you know it doesn't often happen that I have an opportunity or an occasion to think about what I do. You know, in the sense of sort of thinking where does it fit in the world. But his questions were so good that I thought about them a lot, and um, you know then I started writing answers to them. And the answers, uh, hey presto, they sort of joined together to become a, a sort of an extended reflection. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, head right into that. Now, history and storytelling, as I see them, are, are really like trees that were grafted together as seedlings. They're joined so closely together that it's impossible to pick them apart at the root. It's not only the linked etymologies of the words that the grafting is evident. The storyteller's dependence on the past is so inescapable as to be apparent also in the rhetorical form that fiction most commonly uses, which is, of course, the past tense. Time is what makes stories possible. All stories require sequencing. All narratives proceed by creating connections between moments, events, and characters. The greater the sweep of the narrative, the more, the more heavily it must lean on the past, on history, real or imagined. Many storytellers are, in fact, nothing other than historians working with invented sources. It's no coincidence, I think, that this link is explicitly embraced in what I call archival fiction. Uh, you know, novels like uh, The Da Vinci Code, The Name of the Rose, and my own, uh, The Calcutta Chromosome. But historians are also dependent on stories. They, too, create and discover relationships between moments, events, and people. They, too, examine the resulting narratives for meaning and significance. And no one has done that uh, better than Natalie. But history and fiction have another connection, one that is so fundamental, so vital, that we are scarcely aware of it, even though its absence can create a darkness that confounds history itself. Let me explain. As Natalie just said, um, the terrain of history is not an evenly populated continent. As in any landscape, the tracks that are brightly lit are relatively few. 
Large stretches are unilluminated. It's not always because of a lack of habitation that these regions remain shrouded. Often it's because they have yet to find the story that might set their skies alight. This is one very important thing that fiction can do in relation to the past. It can serve as a portal that lets in the light. If fiction is able to do this, it's largely because it works through characters. These protagonists become, as it were, the explorers who step through the doorway. Not all at once, but sequentially as they take us deeper and deeper into this, uh, uh, into this unlit space. But there is a paradox here, for it could be said that after all, uh, a history that reveals itself through invented protagonists is itself a historical and anachronistic, since these characters must be so fashioned as to be recognizable to, uh, to contemporary readers. Uh, this is something that I am really very sort of aware of, I think partly because I was an anthropologist, and this seems to me to, uh, uh, to mirror the question of ethnocentrism, you know, I mean, in what way does one become presentist? And, uh, you know, one of my uh, favorite writers is Marguerite Yoxena, you know, but uh, the book of hers that I like least is, Hadri is the book about Hadrian, you know, which seemed to me very, very presentist, you know, which she is not otherwise. To my mind, this assigns too literal a meaning to the kind of identity that readers seek with fictional characters. What readers actually identify with, I think, is not the characters themselves, but rather their predicaments. To cite an example, the predicament of a mother who is about to be separated from a child is something that can be understood quite independently of the characters. It's the circumstances in which the predicament arises that makes it interesting and historically specific. At the risk of making too sweeping a claim, I would say that the principal reason why storytellers turn to the past is because history is replete with compelling human predicaments. Take Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Uh, what transpired in ancient Rome is no more the central concern of the play than, it, uh, than is Caesar himself. Shakespeare's interest is focused rather on the predicament of Brutus on the one hand and Mark Antony on the other. It's through these predicaments that he explores the themes of loyalty, friendship, and political duty. This is where my own interest in history begins. I'm drawn to the past because it provides instances of predicaments that are unique and unrepeatable instances that have more to say about the human condition than anything I could make up out of whole cloth. I'll cite two instances here, both very meaningful to me because they were each responsible for generating a novel. The first is that of the character called Arjun in my novel, The Glass Palace. Arjun is a carefree young man who joins the British Indian Army shortly before the outbreak of World War II. His main interests are women and cars. He has no time for politics. After the start of the war, he is sent to Singapore with his battalion. There, he suddenly becomes aware that his position in relation to the war is not quite what he had imagined. The fact that he's an Asiatic is thrust upon him when he goes to certain clubs and parks. When he jumps into a swimming pool, all the Europeans leave. Then he is sent to Malaya, where he takes part in the Battle of Jitra, where the British forces suffer a devastating defeat. In the aftermath of the battle, he suddenly finds himself confronting issues that he had never thought about before. Who am I? What brought me here? What is my place in the world? What do I do now? And I know this because I spoke to people who were there and I read their books and I saw the power and the poignance of these questions when they're posed in, fa in effect in a moment of existential crisis, you know, which is also a crisis of the battlefield. The other instance is of Behram Modi, the Parsi merchant in River of Smoke, who finds himself in Canton in December 1838, participating in the events that lead to the outbreak of the First Opium War. Now, it's a fact that merchants from the Bombay presidency were an important presence in Canton in those months. Some played very important roles in those events. We know this from the signed documents and other materials uh, you know, that, we, uh, that we have from that time. Most of these men were adherents of Zoroastrianism, which is a religion with a very rigorous ethical code. What does it mean for a man like Bahram to sign, to sign on to a war that has no justification other than profit? How exactly does he arrive at that position? What is the thinking? What is, his, what, what is the process of consciousness that brings him into that position? In neither instance is the predicament unusual. It's the nature of the circumstances in which they arise that make them especially compelling and poignant. And those circumstances are specific 
to those places, those moments. And that is what I mean in the sense of their being unrepeatable. I, I, I can't recreate that, uh, that, uh, that, that instance, that particular predicament uh, in fiction uh, by, by thinking it up, as it were. The predicament thus becomes the hearth that makes it possible to inhabit this moment, this history. It shapes the narrative and determines the design and the content of the book. This provides a principle of economy, an equivalent of Occam's razor. Everything that goes into the book has to pertain to our understanding of the character's predicaments. World trade, imperial politics, and the development of weaponry do not figure as if by right. Only if it contributes to the predicament does a scene or a detail belong. Everything must con contribute to the plausibility of the character's circumstance. We don't need to know what Arjun studied in school or where he had his first sexual experience, but we do need to know that the debates about the war and about Indian independence were raging in his family and all around him. Similarly, the details of the ways in which Behram relates to the English, to the Chinese, and to his own community is crucial to our understanding of his predicament. His relationship with his sisters and his mothers is secondary and unimportant, not for Behram himself, but for the writer and the reader and for my novel. This then becomes the fundamental principle that guides both my research and my relating of it. This means that writing and research cannot be separated from each other. Until I start developing a character, I don't know where to look. It's only after I start writing that I discover what I need to know. And it's essentially this that drives the research. Periods in which I do nothing but research are fairly limited. It sometimes happens that I'll go into a library or an archive and spend a few weeks there. I did this uh, at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, for example, when I was writing Sea of Poppies, and also at the National Archives in Mauritius. But most of the time, it's the writing that drives the research. For example, suppose I'm writing a scene in which a character has to take a carriage to get from one place to another. Now, it's impossible for me to write a scene convincingly if I can't see it in my own head with my own eyes. To do that, I need to know what the carriage looked like, what the characters were wearing, what the day was like, and so on. So that gives me something to look into and tells me what I should be looking at the next time I happen to be in a library. Approaching history through characters makes the novelist's relationship to the past substantially different from the historian's. In most respects, the novelist's understanding of the subject is far less complete, far less rigorous than that of the historian. I think that goes without saying. But it also bears saying, I think, that there are some respects in which seeing the past through the prism of a character's experience allows for a kind of wholeness that is unavailable to the historian. This may seem like a very tall claim, so I think I'd better illustrate it with some examples. <coughs> this example is taken from my last book, River of Smoke, which is set mainly in Canton, Guangzhou, in China. Now, there exists a fair amount of historical research on the foreign enclave in Canton in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. There are many detailed studies of trade, politics, imperialism, botany, art, and so on. But the foreign enclave in Canton was a tiny place. It was a quarter of a mile in length and less than half that in width. Everybody knew everyone else, at least by sight. The traders danced with each other uh, at every occasion, and they were all great gossips. The same merchants who were making fortunes in, uh, in trading in opium were also patronizing the arts and collecting botanical and zoological specimens. It becomes very easy to lose sight of this when one reads historical monographs on 18th and 19th century Canton. This is because the protocols of historical research impose certain constraints. In the same way that a novel is shaped by its protagonists, a historical monograph is shaped by its subjects and the question that it asks. The trade historian sees a busy port. The historian of science sees a city with innumerable nurseries. The art historian sees a gathering of studios. This limitation is also a strength in that it provides a focus of inquiry and delimits the range of material that allows the professional historian the right to assert claims to truth, or at least verifiability. A work of fiction cannot make truth claims, no matter how detailed or exhaustive the research. Yet, in rendering a setting through the eyes of individuals, a novel can take on the task of recreating the wholeness of a character's experience. And even as I say that the novelist does this, I know that Natalie has done this wonderfully in Martin Gare as well. Of course, this project would not be possible if historians had not laid the foundations. 
Yet, I think I can honestly say that after reading many historical monographs and studies of Canton, I had very little understanding of what interested me most, which is, what was it like to actually be there? <laughs> it is in this sense that I use the word inhabit, because I enter the past in a way that makes me ask what it was like to be present in that place, in that week, on that day. And to piece this together, I depend mainly on memoirs, newspapers, diaries, letters, and other primary sources. To inhabit a place is to be able to see it, to experience it through one's senses, to eat its foods, breathe its smells, rest one's eyes on its sights. Here again, the capaciousness of the novel as a form is a marvelous resource. In a study of trade, there is no place for banquets and gardens. The novelist faces no such restrictions. If trade, banquets, and gardens are aspects of his character's experience, then they all belong legitimately within the book. But of course, any scene, whether in the past or the present, consists of an infinite variety of details. What is to be included and what is to be left out? The material world of the Ibis trilogy, uh, Sea of Poppies and uh, River of Smoke, the first two books at least, is utterly unfamiliar to most of us. This is particularly true of the foreign enclave in Canton, which was visually and otherwise an admixture of an extraordinary range of influences, styles, and taste. Even experienced Western travelers were astonished by its uniqueness, its unfamiliarity. They talk about this time and time again. In order to make this place habitable, I had first had to inhabit it myself. And this I did by recreating, as it were, brick by brick, room by room, uh, factory by factory, uh, the enclave. You know, the maps, the, uh, the architectural drawings, the layout of the rooms, all of this. Fortunately, this was not as difficult a task as, it might be, as might be thought for the Chinese and British artists who worked at Canton had left behind a remarkably detailed visual record of the city, particularly of the foreign enclave. The record is indeed so detailed as to constantly pose the question of what should be included and what should be left out. In deciding this, I follow a simple rule. I include everything that interests me, and I leave out everything that doesn't. <laughs> Many would and have said that there is too much detail in my books. In my own defense, I can say only that a place cannot be inhabited if the brick, the mortar, and the furnishings don't exist. I don't want to serve up a blandly denatured sketch of places and moments that were, in fact, completely unlike any other. The questions that are relevant to me when I'm trying to inhabit a setting are rarely answered by historical accounts. For example, what was the character wearing? What was the time of day? What was the weather like? Generally speaking, these are not the questions that historians ask or even think about. There is, however, one branch of history that does look at the past in much the same way. This is military history, particularly where it provides accounts of battles. The overlap here is quite striking. The questions asked and the details provided are very similar. The weather, the terrain, the clothing, the equipment, states of mind and body. This is all uh, as much uh, interest to the military historian as it is to the novelist. Nor is this the only commonality. It extends also to the treatment of time. Military historians deal, at least in part, with critical instances and decisive events. As with novelists, they write about moments that stand out in time. In other words, they both deal with the jagged edges of the temporal con continuum. Most historians, on the other hand, deal with what we might call smooth time, in which the peaks and valleys of the timeline are either flattened or ignored. There is another important, uh, important respect in which the novel novelist's relation to the past is completely different from that of the historian. The historian's work could not begin without an idea of a recoverable past. The historian necessarily has a sense of responsibility to this past, and this contributes in no small measure to the vital importance of what historians do. But I, as a novelist, see this past through the eyes of my characters. My responsibility is to them. My task is to try to recreate the experience as faithfully as possible. This means that I can ignore certain kinds of material. I don't, for example, have to pay much attention to secular trends in cotton prices over a hundred year period. <laughs> you know? I do, however, have to pay, pay close attention to sudden fluctuations in price. And I have to try to figure out how my character would have responded. In this sense, the historian's past has a wholeness of sweep that the novelist does, does not. 
The difference, I think, is between observing the, f uh, the flow of a river from the shore and from within the waters. The direction of the current is the same in both cases, but a swimmer or a fish has at every moment a million different choices and options. <laughs> there is another very important uh, aspect of the past that is sometimes more accessible to the novelist than to the historian. And again, here, I think uh, an, an Natalie's work is really an exception. But uh, this is, simply put, historical passion. You know, The feelings, emotions, and intimate interpersonal relationships that often drive events. I think most historians would acknowledge this. And that's perhaps the reason why historians read historical fiction, if they do. How important should passion be to, a, un, to an understanding of the past? Well, I'm sure we all differ in the weight we assign to it. I remember an occasion many years ago when I gave a draft manuscript of my book in an antique land to one of my contemporaries, a scholar who has since proved to be possibly the most brilliant Indian historian of my generation. After reading my manuscript, he advised me to throw it into the dustbin and remarked, <laughs> he remarked in a voice seething with contempt that I seem to be more interested in feelings than in trade. <laughs> well, I plead guilty to that. I wouldn't be a novelist if I were not. Now, of course, it's true that in the long durée, uh, emotions have little effect on history. But it's also true that sometimes they do play a critical event, in, uh, a critical role in events, so much so that certain very important events become incomprehensible if they're excluded. Take the first Opium War, an event that I think we would all agree has had monumentous uh, 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 con consequences for the world. This war was in one respect a product of a deep history, brought on by seismic shifts in the, in the relations between land masses and continents and so on. Yet, as with many seismic events, the tremors that set the eruption in motion originated in a place that was very small, the foreign enclave in Canton. In reading the standard historical accounts of the war, it became clear to me that the events were actually set in motion by a very small uh, group of people in the space of a few months. So, you know, you have here a sort of Aristotelian thing of uh, unity of time, place, and action. Yet from the secondary accounts, and I defy anyone here to go and read all the se se secondary accounts that exist of those, of, of those uh, few months, it's impossible to make sense of wh why people were doing what they were doing. You simply cannot make sense of it. One day they're saying this, the next day they're saying that. They're clearly lying a lot of the time. They're manipulating. And you know, after a while, you know, in a way, you just can't figure out. It becomes clear. It becomes clear that you know this is a group of people who are lying, bullying, wo wooing, hectoring, and jockeying for advantage in a manner that's familiar to all of us or to anyone who served on a committee, for example. <laughs> and in a sense, you know, when you put together the words, when you see the constellation of events that happens, you begin to see the characters begin to invent themselves. You know, you see that you know they bring themselves to life. Uh, well, uh, uh, I, I'll just take a, another couple of minutes. Perhaps the most formidable barrier to inhabiting the worlds that I write about is that of language. The action of the Ibis trilogy, for instance, unfolds in a theater that teems with languages and dialects. This is true not only of the wider setting, which is the Indian Ocean, but also the specific locations in, mo in which most of the events take place. The ships, for example, are uh, you know, incredibly diverse. The crews are from all over the Indian Ocean. At the same time, you also have uh, European officers and so on. And I, I think this presents a sort of extraordinary challenge uh, you know, to uh, 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 two writers, really, because you know, as novelists, how is, how is a novelist to inhabit or recreate this multilingual setting? The problem arises not only for the novelist writing in English. It would have to be confronted in any language, since the novel is, after all, essentially a monolingual form. A novel can perhaps accommodate two or more languages if they happen to be written in the same or, or in similar scripts as in Western Europe. But in the Indian Ocean, even the scripts are different. So clearly, there can be no literal solution to the conundrum. My own way of addressing it is to suggest linguistic variety by using many different dialects and registers of English. And fortunately, there are many to choose from, because uh, the early 19th century was perhaps the golden age for the proliferation of the varieties of English. Well, I'll stop there. I haven't said much about the global past aspect of it, but I, I thought that uh, that's something we can discuss as we go on.
thank you very much. We have um, about a good half hour or so for questions. Maybe I, maybe I can start us off by, I mean, it's, it's striking, listening uh, now after Amitav's talk, to think about how much you both still have in common. Yes. As a historian, as a novelist, I mean, just the other day, Natalie spoke to the graduate students and talked about the problem of a blank space in research. And what do you do with a blank space? And how do you deal with that? And how she has dealt with that? And Amitav's talking about fiction letting through the light. Um, and I'm wondering if, if, if I could uh, ask, I mean, Natalie, to what extent do you think about things like characters, plot, literary devices? To what extent do these things come up as you're writing, uh, when you're writing history? Well, uh, I guess I think I need that. That mic back. Okay, just move this one. Can you pick me up on this? Uh, this it was at this point in Amitabh's marvelous remarks that when he talked about uh, his main goal having to be the character's predicament and his plausibility, that I thought he was right. That not in terms of our being uninterested in the character, but that that would be the main goal. Uh, that that would be that that would that, that was that that had to be your, your main loyalty, yeah. and our loyalty would be would be more would be more diverse. Uh, we we would be it dependent on the big topic that we were trying to explore. We would always have to keep that in mind. On the other hand, uh, the sometimes character or what you call the the consciousness of the, of the predicament is central uh, to to what, what to what we're doing. Uh, and that we, uh, though we may not want to uh, think about all the bricks and every meal, things that would be important to, to you, for, to, there, there would be occasions in which two things would be very important. The precise ca consciousness and to understand the character of the person, uh, because a, a major decision was happening that had to do uh, with an economic decision, with a military, whatever, military decision, a political decision, a family decision, decision to, to marry, to run away, uh, react, uh, uh, and uh, the, th this is, this is the, pr the reason why historians sometimes do not just stand on the shore and watch the river go by, but try to get in there and, sw and swim with the fish, That's to understand, uh, to understand that. In, in my own case, uh, I, uh, Yes, I sometimes am, am deeply interested, specifically, and in, I would fr frame it more in terms of, of consciousness and character too. Uh, to to go back to to um, to Martin Gare, where I, I spent partly because I had to help the filmmakers prepare the film. I actually did character sketches of the people, as uh, for them, and in fact, uh, based very carefully on what I had looked at in the social history and the village history. I mean, they weren't just made up. They, uh, or just made from a single text. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, that plus uh, thinking about, uh, not here a, a novelist, but the way the actors were, were responding to playing the characters gave me not solutions, but interesting questions to put to my material so I could think about. Uh, uh, and uh, the, so I, I, I sometimes do try to do this. The, uh, just to give an example from my trip, future trip to, in a few days to Tiverton, uh, you had talked about uh, what does it mean to have a process of consciousness. And again, we sometimes care a great deal about this. The, uh, in this case, I am trying to understand what the manumitted son of a slave woman would experience a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old boy first going to Soho Academy in London and then going to Tiverton and going to school there uh, and being one of almost certainly the only person of color. And it isn't just looking at that uh, from the outside uh, and, but, mm -hmm. and thinking about how the family is doing, his white father and so forth, but trying to understand what it would be like for him, his predicament, precisely his predicament. And he seems to have been, and how he managed it. And when I read in his father's diary, for those of you who know John Gabriel Stedman, John Gabriel Stedman is the father, and it's, that's the diary I'm looking at. When he says, this lad uh, had somebody sleep over, I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> he had one of the, his school friends sleep over. And, uh, so it's, it's, 
uh, so I'm trying to work toward at least some sense of him and his character, in addition to seeing what it might mean for that town to have a person of color at a moment when the Methodists are there. Does it have any impact on, uh, on what happens in regard to the slave trade? And reaction would be part of my story. It might or might not be part of the novelist story who would be telling the same thing. So I, I think that there's some overlap uh, in regard to character in my own practice, but again, the, the, our, our bottom line uh, is, is, I think, not going to be uh, uh, the same in that. Uh, uh, and just can I say one other difference? There were so many similarities, but one other, I think it's true that, that though in the course of our writing, we do run to the library and look up all kinds of things that we hadn't thought about. Uh, we also have to look a lot of them up ahead of time before we decide what we're going to write. So that, so that there's an interactive process uh, along, uh, along the way. And uh, uh, th th so there would be a different balance yes. in, in our work there. Yes. Could we, could we talk just a bit more about the global side now? So Amitav, if we could push you a bit farther. As, um, now let's give us a picture of telling local stories and the importance of a global context. Is it about characters then? I mean, to what extent does the global aspect of the stories you tell matter? Um, it matters a lot to me, really. Um, but, you know, I face the problem that really uh, everybody from my part of the world faces, which is that when you confront these issues, the utter and resounding silence of uh, Indian sources on, uh, on, these, um, on these matters, you know. For example, uh, on, uh, on the indenture, you know. Uh, by the early 19th century, we, we actually have a fair number of slave uh, narratives you know, uh, written by African-American slaves. Uh, the, f the earliest uh, uh, narratives we get on the indenture are from the late 19th century. So, you know, it's a kind of incredibly frustrating thing. I mean, if you do want to write about um, um, th uh, that range of issues, you're sort of thrown back on having to invent. So, you know, for me, um, I wanted to write, uh, you know, a sort of... Uh, when I started writing my novel, The Glass Palace, it be I wanted to write a family history, you know, ab about the part of my family yes. Yes. that had been in Burma. But uh, I realized very soon that it was going to be a very thin book if I was going to <laughs> rely on the <laughs> sources available. So, in a way, uh, that, is also, uh, that is also the problem. But you know what happens is that I do think uh, that because, and this is what I mean by, you know, um, uh, narrative uh, storytelling can sometimes be, as it were, a door opener. Mm -hmm. Because uh, once you imagine a way of thinking about a certain moment in time, people follow, you know? And often we don't think about certain places, certain moments in time, simply because they don't exist in our imagination, you know? Mm -hmm. And I saw this very much with my book, The Hungry Tide, you know, because uh, the Sundarbans, in effect, had no narrative at all. Even if you were in Calcutta, which is like, uh, you know, 15 miles from the Sundarbans, mm -hmm. you know? I think, uh, do I have to keep moving this? I, uh, I think that uh, your image of uh, the novelist uh, trying to be, did you say, a pioneer, that is to be the explorer, uh, a kind of a vanguard into areas uh, in which there has been uh, which seems very difficult to get historical material. I think that's a very nice uh, role to think of the novelist as playing. And I would like to, uh, uh, I think historians can do some of that too, but uh, I, I would like to take that term I used of thought experiment, which, which does not have the same kind of truth claim uh, hmm. that, that, uh, uh, we, that historians might make. And that you could think of this as, as, a, as being offered the, these, this movement into a new area. Uh, as a, uh, as a, a, a thought experiment, uh, in a way. But we sometimes do try to find ways, even without the, the autobiography or the memoir from an indentured servant, we try to find ways, to, even we try to make, find ways to make up for it. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the problems with uh, writing a global history mm -hmm. uh, is really that often, I mean, I think the way that history is written, you're writing about significant streams of events, significant uh, uh, movements in, in history. 
But when you're writing about uh, connect, connected people, for example, uh, like Elias the Babylonian, uh, which John Paul has written about, and similarly uh, Leo Africanus, is that you're writing about outliers, mm -hmm. you know, who don't fit into an easy pattern. And it's precisely because of that that I think so often the interconnectedness uh, is impossible to, or the interconnectedness doesn't attract the attention that it should. For example, Zoroastrianism. You know, Zoroastrian, from Zoroastrianism follows this entire range of, um, uh, you know, leading to your book, the Cathars. Mm -hmm. All of them are in one way or the other descendants of a certain kind of uh, a Zoroastrian uh, theological thinking. You know, some of them are explicitly so, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, that entire history, because Zoroastrianism is defeated, you know, repeatedly by, uh, by first by Alexander, then by, um, uh, by, uh, then by Islam, it becomes, as it were, an underground knowledge, knowledge system of the world. And yet it's absolutely present everywhere you look, mm -hmm. you know, well into the late, mid, uh, late Middle Ages and beyond that, mm -hmm. you know. Another is, uh, you know, which I discovered... Uh, Say, uh, reading uh, Henry Mayhew's, uh, the, you know, The Life of the Poor in London, mm -hmm. the omnipresence of the gypsy, mm -hmm. you know, especially in, uh, within slum life mm -hmm. in London, but most of all within the English language. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so, uh, we often think that it, it was the English in India who were passing on the, the Indian words mm -hmm. into, but actually it was often the gypsies who mm -hmm. were, you know, mm -hmm. passing Indian words mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. So these histories of the connected, I mean, uh, of people who are functioning mm -hmm. as links. Mm -hmm. Elias being such an interesting mm -hmm. example because he actually represents a, an instance mm -hmm. where you see that Eastern Christianity has such a vibrant presence, mm -hmm. uh, you know, within the Western mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. So I would say really that in some way the, the fundamental question of history, uh, I, you know, you, you talked about provincializing Europe. Mm -hmm. I had a long correspondence with Dipesh about that. I admire the book in many ways, but I think the way that he is sort of uh, reversing the, uh, the, uh, the gaze, as it were, mm -hmm. is too simplistic. Mm -hmm. I think in a way the real question should be, of history, should be how does it happen that Europe constitutes itself as the central actor yes, of history, well, yes. you know? And wh wh what are the casualties, mm -hmm. you know? What, is, what happens to mm -hmm. all the questions that could have been asked mm -hmm. around the margin? Mm -hmm. Exactly the questions yes, that yes. you're asking and yes. uh, John Paul well, is asking. Well, he, he, I mean, I think when you, the, the first step after you talk about provincializing Europe is precisely doing that. And as you speak, uh, it, it, it is, it is uh, grounds for hope. I mean, I know two marvelous dissertations right now on the Roma. Oh, really? Oh, yes, it, it's, it's, uh, it's precisely with the spirit in which, in which you speak, and some of them very attentive to issues of language and storytelling. Uh, and so, so it's, this, this, is, this is occurring. And the only thing I would, would say is that when you say outliers, it sounds as though they don't make a difference. Mm. And I think they do make a difference. I, I completely agree. Uh, that, I, outliers make, make history. Yes, yeah, so, but right, so that they're not just out there and, and, and uh, as you said, the, 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 the story of Zoroastrianism is a story that it may be underground, but in fact it's, it's being influenced. It's influencing. So, uh, yeah, we're finding convergence here. <laughs> Should we open up to questions? Questions? Yes, please. Um, and, 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 you could, and, if you could, and if you could speak up. So, the acoustics are pretty good in this room, but. Yeah, sorry, I'm Caroline Humphrey, anthropologist. I have a question about the case where actually the story might be told, but actually told in another language, uh, something that's not translated and is kind of invisible. And, but there's already got all kinds of debates and passions around it in your sources. How do you deal with that kind of situation? <laughs> So a question about uh, stories that are already circulating and the problems that they come with once you get them. Maybe already subject to novels. Yes. Oh, you mean how would he a historian or how would a novelist? No, Martin Guerre is a perfect example. Both of you, both of you, really. I mean, yes. So when something is has a strong present history that everyone is talking about, I'm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. As a novelist or a historian, we're doing. I see, I see. Rather than moving into a new field, into an uncharted field. Yes. Well, it, as I, it, like Martin Gare. I, I had this case with both Martin Gare and and uh, and always on the man that Europeans call Leo Africanus, where there was 
in, in one case, a story told over and over and over again. Poetry, plays, operas, and uh, it so happened, and this is interestingly enough often the case with imposters, the people like to tell the story and they don't go, go back to the village of the archives and check it out. So, so that, was, uh, that, that, was, that was less of a, of a, of a problem. Uh, it, it was just uh, an enormous pleasure, as I was telling the students uh, uh, on Wednesday. In fact, it had been told so much that when I finally got the parliamentary records, the court records in my hand, I was praying that it was going to be really there. I thought maybe they, it had been completely made up, but, but in fact, it really had happened. Uh, it, it can be, uh, uh, with the, the Leo Africanus st story, interestingly enough, uh, where there still are problems because there, there are these things that one would like to know more. One looks and looks in the archives and there are still areas that one... Uh, the stakes are much higher in different interpretations in regard to him than in regard to uh, a, an impo a peasant imposter and, and reshaping, uh, reshaping in village life and the judges. The, the stakes are much higher uh, in that story partly because uh, it's a story that has a lot of resonance for politics today, uh, and uh, partly I discovered because he's a figure, partly because, in a sense because of the enigmas about him, that some people want to construct uh, as quite readily integrated and accepted, not an outlier, uh, would want to see him another way, uh, want to see Europe, Europe as more welcoming to him. Uh, Others like, and I probably have my own convictions that are part of my, my preference to see what I see in the, what to, what to me the record seems to show, that he was a person of much more intention with the European world. So there, there are political and cultural stakes. There may be even methodological stakes. That, and, and that will make a difference when the historian comes into a field where there has been at least some writing rather than completely opening it himself or herself. Uh, uh, that makes uh, perfect sense, uh, uh, especially because uh, we, um, the the story of Maknagir is so much surrounded by um, uh, by controversy. I th uh, but again, you know, for me as a novelist, uh, it's not really an issue. I mean, I don't feel that I have to engage with uh, everything that's been mm -hmm. written around the subject. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm viewing it from the eye like of the that. character. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Question? Yes. Oh. Uh, sorry, my English not very good. Uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, Zoristan. Yeah. Actually, uh, I love to tell you because this is my research. He left, uh, he didn't, uh, you think he defeated, but in my understanding, uh, because he comes from Persia, he, is, he left the culture for today. So he said, I will be returned when there is a battle between evil and God. Who is the evil? The Chinese Communist Party who persecute poor people and, and genocide and slavery, according to United Nations and Amnesty International, and, and, the, and, the, and, corrupt, and corruption, and yeah, the, 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 the silence about this. And so, actually, it brought a good thing uh, this. Uh, Excuse me, do, do you have a question? No, no. And no. true compassion for parents, and in Persia, all the world no practicing. It brings unity and true compassion. But other it, evil force try to make people away from the true what genocide are happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Question? Yes, Maxine, please. Um, I'd just like to ask uh, a question related to the kind of global history approach that um, both of you have engaged with. I was really intrigued in reversal with the description of the place of Canton is small, the smallest, the small space, and how um, Amitav Ghosh had reconstructed all of this so that you, you got a, a real sense of what it was like to be there. Um, I've read accounts more of the 18th century area, but there's nothing that really conveys this sense of what it was like to be there. But we do have a sense of um, can, of this area, Canton, as having these connections with all with the wider world, etc. 
But I think another place in China is one that's really interesting to look at, and that's Zhengde Zhen, which produced porcelain for the world from an early period. And yet, most people receiving that porcelain would have no idea of the city where it came from. And the people there producing that porcelain had little contact with this wider world of trade, etc. Merchants um, came and placed the orders and collected the porcelain. Um, another interesting parallel is to look at the city today. And do people there have a sense of their the globe, you know, their place in global history. No. And even a major Chinese artist like Ai Weiwei um, can fill the turbine hall with porcelain seeds made in Zhengde Zhen. But his labels, they just stated that this was mm -hmm. a city that produced for the, um, for the court, the Chinese court. Mm -hmm. um, and there is this huge city at the center of this major trade. And mm -hmm. so I think sort of it does seem mm -hmm. to me that perhaps, um, perhaps you could both say a little bit more mm -hmm. about key places, locations, <coughs> spaces which, um, in which you can, which are significant and to make that you know, draw out some comparison. Sure. Well, I'll just make a very brief comment then. Uh, <coughs> Your, your comment makes me think of a, of a sort of a double mission. One is to continue the process of spelling out these kinds of trade connections, production connections, movements. And the other, and you've said it so well, is while we're doing that, we don't neglect the, uh, the lack of information. I, would, I was talking before about the people who do know, who do travel, who are aware of some kinds of multilinguality, uh, 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 but of course a great many people receive this and have no, no sense of where it comes from, or, or rather little sense. And I think that should be part of the commission, that part of the charge of the historian looking at these broad connections to point out the, the lack of it, like where the, there is not a consciousness of it. These processes go on and we don't know, and that's, that, that would be a really, what people do not know, uh, mm -hmm in the past is, and, and it, do, it can be done, it doesn't have to be done as naughty naughty, but you know, just <laughs> not reproving them for having our consciousness or a wider perspective, but understanding what's at stake and, and, and not knowing. Um, you know, uh, for me, um, uh, having sort of thought, spent a lot of time, uh, you know, reading about and thinking about uh, uh, sort of the great international centers of, um, uh, of exchange and, uh, and trade and so on, you know, we think of Venice, we think of, uh, you know, we think of uh, so many cities. And, but, uh, you know, Canton uh, perhaps uh, gave more to the world than any other city in world history. I mean, all the porcelain, uh, though produced elsewhere, was exported through Canton. If you just look at its influence on the built environment of England, you know, I mean, look at uh, uh, the flowers. You know, I mean, so much of the English garden really came out of Canton in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, uh, the furniture, the, you know, uh, 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 so much uh, painting, silk, textiles. I mean, you know, it's, it's a virtually an endless list. You could just go on. I mean, I, I really think it, a case could be made for saying that, you know, no city has given the world as much as Canton has. <laughs> and yet, you know, it has no existence in, in our imaginative lives. You know, of the world at large, it has no existence. I mean, I'd always heard this, uh, this, uh, of this place called Canton, what it looked like. What, I mean, I've always known what Venice looks like. I've always sort of known basically what Fez uh, is like, or Alexandria, but, you know. So for me, it was so exciting, actually, to be bringing this, you know, to be fleshing out, just for my own sake, you know, to be fleshing out this town, to be trying to, to, trying to inhabit it, as, a, as it were. So. And this seems to be one place where uh, recovering a lost narrative city uh, story seems 
to be, I mean, I, somewhat uh, historians might be envious of what a novelist can do with this. Because when we lack the sort of sources, or when we lack, as you talked about, the Indian sources, ways of getting at this that you can put with a footnote at the end, it would be very nice to be able to just sort of make subaltern speak as, as you wish, or do it as never. Well, I just wanted to say that I, I both loved the way you treated this in your book and appreciated your comment, but just as, an, just as a, I wouldn't, I don't care if it's the most important city. <laughs> it can be just marvelous the way it is, and made it, I don't, it doesn't have to be the most important city. Maybe you were just speaking exuberantly. <laughs> <laughs> but it can be really fine and, and you know, there are other important places too. Just Absolutely. <laughs> uh, there are other important places, but that's the exciting you know, thing. It doesn't that... make any difference. But, but it's the most, you know, that, that, it doesn't have to be, it can still be its own thing. Okay, we'll yeah. say a important city. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's because that most important thing gets you it gets you, that's a bad path to go down. <laughs> it gets you into the kind of... <laughs> John Powell? You have both um, spoken about characters of being important in different ways. Um, um, and, and this brought to mind um, the question of, of how much you rely on the idea of a, hum a universal human nature. I mean, you need to empathize with characters from different periods and cultures. At which point do you, are you in a danger of projecting your own assumptions onto those characters? I mean, how much does cultural difference matter, and how much can you uh, avoid falling into the trap of making someone from a different period and a different time, a different culture, um, kind of too much like yourself, or the kind of people you know? Mm -hmm. uh, which is something that really kind of concerns me as a historian very much, which is the question of, of how far do we go in reconstructing? Well, okay. uh, that is, of course, a danger of, of what would I do, and then you put yourself more into the picture. Uh, without looking at the larger question of character, but staying on the simpler question, perhaps, if it is of consciousness, so that you don't have to have a whole, to, to see all the passions of a person, or all the feelings and anxieties and hopes. I try to, to get quite precise Information. I'll just give you an example of what I've been thinking about right now, and, and again in regard to the slavery project. Uh, a 16 or 17 year old young man who has, uh, or, or, or young maybe in his 20s, who has a scarified face, been circumcised in an important moment, went through rites of passage, is used to a family life. In this case, he was a man of rather high status where his father had maybe 20 wives and compounds. Get, get these sets, and then think about the transition of being a father in a place where scarification is not done. How do you have a son, and, and what do you do about circumcision? When you come, when you know the place you've come from, that, that, that woman, Let's leave aside the question of female circumcision. The woman wouldn't want to marry a man or who wasn't circumcised. In other words, you just take these concrete kinds of things and then imagine, try to think, well, how would he react to uh, a situation in which these really quite important things that he'd been grown up to expect would be different? And you see, you see how you would, and, and so, so I tried to work quite, I just took that as an example because it's one I'm just, just, been writing, just about to write about. <laughs> just about the next page, and and then, then just work quite hard on that cluster of things, and not say what I would do, but try to think about what I know about the way he has been brought up, the values that that he's had, what he's been taught, the length, some of the words that he knew, and then try to work from that onto uh, 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 imagining not a whole character, uh, but but to a, to a, at least a set of a consciousness, and and then then you've got evidence about. The, behavior later on that plantation. You, you know what the out, some of the outcomes are, and try to put, put that together. Uh, the, uh, the, the other thing is that you sometimes get signs, again, this is not quite character, but you sometimes get very important signs. A lot of people here are, in fact, working on the history of emotions in this room. You sometimes get signs in your texts, uh, uh, to be sure, in their language from the past, about a passion. 
uh, about a, a and and uh, expressions of emotion, and you can I think build on those and see what the reactions uh, are are to them. So uh, if we, I, we if the more we can be informed by and attentive to by our sources and attentive to their habits of language, uh, the the more we have a way to. Uh, correct for or be to, to allow for difference from our own. Now, it's, we're always going to be part of the story. I mean, I sort of like to think of our own work there as a resource, not just as a problem <laughs> uh, when we're when we're trying to create characters or consciousness. But those were some of the things that I would suggest uh, that that one do uh, does. Uh, I would absolutely second everything you said. I mean, in fact, all you can do really is to uh, you know be attentive to the language and uh, to languages, circumstances. And even there, you know, if you're doing uh, really sort of interconnected histories, uh, it's actually uh, almost impossible to know all the languages in the Indian Ocean mm -hmm. area, especially. I mean, they're so different. So what can you do? I mean, it's uh, uh, you either, uh, you know, uh, very few historians will have the will have the technical equipment to do it. And as a uh, as a writer, you step in so that people can tell you, well, you got this all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Right, uh, we have a, a few minutes. Should we get, yeah? Um, all right, in the back. Yeah, right back there. Jason Pack, uh, just a quick question. We've talked today about. Project, please. I should project even more? Even more, yes. Okay. Jason Pack, I'm a historian. Um, just a quick question. We've talked today about storytelling and the role of narrative. I wanted to ask you about the place of causation in telling a good story and a good narrative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That that is that is a good one, and, and we can we can the, the uh, it, it might it, of course it is part of the story. Uh, the uh, the focused uh, the tale story may have a multiple causation that is uh, that that uh, might uh, draw not only on say social conflict, uh, uh, po uh, political aspirations. Uh, political ch chicanery and so forth, there might be the this passion that might surface that is idiosyncratic or unusual things that might occur. Uh, and both things have to be attended to. What we The larger issues of causation, which we can describe or, or try to analyze, whichever our preference is. Uh, and then these, these if, again, if you're doing a focused uh, story, the, the incidental things, the surprising things, the unusual turns, uh, I'm going to just, if I may, just give just give an example uh, of, uh, uh, a, uh, of a a case that I worked on recently, uh, where a the black driver, the black the black officer, uh, the leading slave on a plantation, uh, was part of uh, uh, led an uprising against the, the owner, and many of the slaves ran away to the woods. Uh, and he murdered, he also, he and his partners murdered uh, the, the, man, the owner of the plantation. Now, when, if you just looked at the causation, and more generally you would look at uh, oppression on the plantation or expectations of the slaves, the power of the brooms, there were a lot of things that would be very, very important. Uh, and and uh, the, the way the, the slaves were treated, uh, food supplies, all of those things would be part of the causation. When I read the court case, I discovered that in addition, passion was involved, that the owner had, uh, that there was a competition about a woman. The owner, who wasn't in fact one of the worst manager, the one of the worst, uh, most oppressive uh, uh, plantation managers uh, in the colony, had taken to his bed uh, the prized wife of this very important black slave, and they were competing. They were actually competing, these two men, about the woman. It comes out in the course of the trial spoken not by the man is dead, but about people who knew him. So that that's part of the story. Uh, the, the, it's, the, it's the way, that, it's the way that, that social conflict sometimes gets acted out. You have both the, the broader issues, and it's, I think it's, it's, it's very meaningful and exciting, actually, to sometimes be able to tell it with both causation in a broad sense and uh, a narrated life story uh, with its surprises in detail. Uh, from, from my point of view, you know, causation is uh, 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 not as important as intentions and motivations, you know, uh, because, uh, I mean, I'm not dealing with sort of inanimate, uh, you know, uh, things which sort of impinge on each other in such a way as to 
generate relations of cause and effect. So it's really much more to do with uh, intentions, motivations. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So I think we will <clears throat> bring it to a close now. Uh, before we thank our speakers, uh, let me mention that there is a wine reception immediately afterwards uh, taking place at Crash uh, in the atrium of the Allison Richards building. I'm not sure if we've put on for enough for everyone, but I think, I think everyone, you're all welcome, so please do join us afterwards. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank uh, Ruth Rushworth at Crash for help in organizing this event. So let me end by saying uh, something about our speakers. <clears throat> now, some of you will, of course, know what is perhaps the most unforgettable prologue to any history book, at least one written uh, by Natalie Davis, in Women on the Margins, um, which begins with an imagined dialogue. And, and historians will identify with this feeling, in which Natalie uh, is having a conversation with the three women who are subjects of her book. And in the dialogue, the three women seem disappointed by Natalie's book. <laughs> and they criticize her for different things, but it seems to be mainly that they criticize her for having woven together three very different lives, as they see it, into a single story. And Natalie's sort of pushed against the wall. She says to them, and I quote here, I wanted to find out whether you three women had struggles with gender hierarchies. And to which they all responded indignantly, gender hierarchies? What are gender hierarchies? <laughs> so now the implication is that perhaps, um, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I've read it right again, uh, the implication is that perhaps as historians sometimes we look for and we emphasize things that are more important to us yeah. than to the people we write about. Uh, so from, from today's conversation, I think that's, that's come out a bit as well, the question of how important are these connections to the people that lived in the period. And yet, at the same time, we read Amitav's books, and we see characters carried away on a tide of events, a tide of global events. We read about the joy and the tragedies of these people's lives, and we must wonder whether they did reflect on the way in which global connections impacted on their lives. I should say the prologue to Natalie's uh, book ends with uh, Natalie begging the three women, saying, give me another chance, read it again. <laughs> now, ever the consummate storytellers, Natalie and Amitav have left us yet again waiting to read their next books, works that I'm sure will continue to speak in the words of one of the, their books to the possibility of communication and curiosity in a world sometimes divided by violence. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please thank me, uh, join me in thanking <laughs> Natalie, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.